Welcome to Science vs. Cinema. On this episode, Star Trek Picard. We're here at the Sunstone Villa, also known as Chateau Picard. Jean-Luc Picard is back for new adventures. I have a plan. Another top secret unauthorized rescue mission. On this episode, we talk to the cast. You really want me to answer? <laughs> yeah. The producers. Well, does warp drive actually work? And some experts to see if they got the science right. I hate to say this, but robots. I'm going to assume you've seen at least the first episode where most of the scientific concepts are introduced. Picard is one of my favorite characters in all of Star Trek, and he's even a little bit of a scientist. I got to ask Patrick Stewart about that. So from Picard, we've seen in a alternate life, he was an astrophysicist. What is my rank of position? You are Lieutenant Junior Grade, Assistant Astrophysics Officer. Although he was a loser, so thanks for that. <laughs> but, but, he was, but he's also been an archeologist and he's got this sort of scientific side to him. Do you think we'll see that in, in the show? Everything that we experience of Jean-Luc in Next Generation will at times crop up. Um, sometimes, um, just spontaneously, he he lives in here, mm -hmm. and and uh, he's sometimes in control, and I'm not, uh, and so I think it's very possible that there will be spontaneous and and uh, unexpected perhaps moments when that occurs. I asked some of the cast playing the more scientific characters if they did any research for their roles. Have you talked to any scientists to prepare for your role, or have you done any research to think about? No, my friend. Yeah, <laughs> she knows it all. Yeah, no, you this know. is no, this is okay. I love this universe so much, but I don't believe there's much scientific reading that would uh, prepare me for this role in particular. Though I do have interest in AI, uh, sentient synthetics that appear human inside and out. It's much easier for me to be led by the script um, than than vice versa. So, are you a scientist? Yes, I'm an astrophysicist. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> so if you're He's a real Star Trek person, that's as right. opposed to me, I'm a fake Star Trek well, person. You see, I am a t a totally non-scientific. I have <laughs> precious little education of any kind. But somebody once asked me, all right, Patrick, tell us um, exactly how fast is uh, I, is the Enterprise going in in in, in super space? And uh, I said, uh, Oh well, you wouldn't want to do it on the freeway <laughs> <laughs> because I had no idea what it was. Star Trek can be kind of far out when it comes to the science, so I understand if the actors want to stick to the script. I'm more concerned with the writers and the producers, so I asked them if they ever talked to science advisors. We have two layers of them, actually. We have one science advisor who's unstaffed to, to all the shows, mm -hmm. so when we go to like really deep dive weird stuff, we say, okay, what's the closest to reality here? We have two writers on staff, um, uh, Anthony Moranville and Chris Silvestri, who actually one of them has, I think, a PhD in, I don't want to say astrophysics, but it's, it's something in the neighborhood something of that. Science. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Something science. Right, something science-like, right? Smarter than me, let me put it that way. And um, they are on staff all the time. So whenever we're breaking story, when you're in the room and you're trying to justify a plot point and you're looking to science to help you, they just throw it right out there. You find as you're making Star Trek, I think that you sort of are keeping abreast of what's happening because you kind of have to. Scientific concepts and ideas that we touch on in the show, news about those ideas is always popping up on my phone. I subscribe to a lot of news feeds that are science and I, something about an astronomical fact or a fact about you know robotics or a fact about propulsion systems or you're gonna be using things like that in what you're writing. How do you go about doing that with Star Trek? In terms of the science of Star Trek or the mm -hmm. pseudoscience or the kind of imaginary science, let's yeah. call it, of Star Trek, a lot of the research you know, has been conducted, if you will, by fans mm -hmm. over the decades. And you know, there's various repositories. There are books, and there's this amazing website, MemoryAlpha.com. Right? Too. So do we. <laughs> and you know, well, does warp drive actually work within the framework, the fictional framework of Star Trek? Well, you go to Memory Alpha, and there's long, intricate, detailed disquisition with examples from various episodes. Transporters and warp drive are necessary to tell a good story, so I'm okay with that. But if you're going to talk about a supernova, that is a real-world thing that I know something about. So you better get the science right. A star and a supernova. I lead a worldwide group of more than 200 scientists called the Global Supernova Project. So I was really excited to see a supernova in Picard. 
This all started in the 2009 J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie. The supernova destroyed Romulus. There's just one problem, though. The star that blew up wasn't Romulus's host star. Using red matter, I would create a black hole which would absorb the exploding star. Obviously, you wouldn't be saving anyone if you turned Romulus's sun into a black hole. But a supernova can't destroy a planet around a different star. In the tie-in comic book Countdown, they said that the star that blew up was the Hobus star, 500 light years away from Romulus. They said it could propagate through subspace and could somehow threaten the whole galaxy. This is really dumb. I wrote about it at the time and talked about it with Alex Kurtzman's writing partner, Bob Orsi. So I was happy to see that in Picard, it seems like they've retconned things so that it's Romulus's host star that blows up. When you first learned that the Romulan sun was going to explode and the terrible consequences that would bring, what feelings came up for you? I asked Alex Kurtzman about this, but he kind of sidestepped the question. It seemed like it was a different star that blew up. Is that changed? And if so, why? Well, we, uh, we really took it from our 2009 Star Trek film, right? So we know that a star went supernova and destroyed Romulus and um, the Romulans were spread in a diaspora around the universe. And that, that is the history that informs so much of what happened because what happens on this show is that it actually had ripple effects in ways that people didn't even imagine beyond the Romulans. It, it radically impacted synthetics. And um, you'll see that in the show. Does Romulus's star going supernova even make sense? Even though I'm an expert on supernovae, I thought it'd be more fun to ask my friend and colleague Brian Schmidt about it because he's got a Nobel Prize. So I asked him, what kinds of stars go supernova? So a star that's getting a lot of attention right now, Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion, these are red supergiants, maybe 10 to 15 times the mass of our sun. It burns through its energy quite quickly. At the end of its life, it is extended out to about the orbit of Mars from our, our sun's position. And then the center of it essentially runs out of nuclear fuel and collapses. And in that collapse, it forms what we call a neutron star, possibly a black hole sometimes, and they explode. Betelgeuse in Orion. It's been getting weirdly dim lately, but we don't think it's gonna blow up right now. It could be a few years from now, it could be 100,000 years from now. But when it does, it's going to be a spectacular sight. It's gonna get about as bright as the half moon and stay that way for several months. In fact, it'll even be visible for years as one of the brightest things in the sky. So these red supergiants don't live very long, right? So it's unlikely that, say, life would evolve around a star that's a red supergiant. The lifetime of these stars is only 80 million years. And so it's not even clear Earth was habitable at all in 80 million years after the formation of the solar system. That's okay, though, because if you remember your Star Trek history... The Romulans are an offshoot of my Vulcan blood. They left Vulcan a few thousand years ago, so it's okay to make Romulus's star a supergiant. What about the color? Most stars that blow up are red supergiants, but Romulus's host star is yellow. That's okay, because in 2011, my colleagues found a supernova that came from a yellow supergiant, so it is possible. It's pretty cool how they depict the remnant of the Romulan supernova, and it looks a lot like supernova 1987A. So supernova 1987A is the closest supernova, not just in yours and my lifetimes, but for the last many hundreds of years. So in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, a star exploded in 1987. And the light would have, of course, been emitted 185,000 years earlier. But this was unusual because the star that exploded was quite compact. It was a blue supergiant. So quite bright, very hot, more than 10,000 degrees Celsius. And we believe it had been previously part of a binary system, probably many thousands of years before the explosion. The two stars had actually merged together to form one. So now with the Hubble Space Telescope, we look at it and we see a very complicated set of rings that are left over from the binary star that it was before it merged. And they kind of string out material in orbits. When the object exploded, got lit up like a neon sign. And so we can kind of see traces of the star's previous life. Since the Romulan star didn't have pre-existing gas rings, it really wouldn't look like that. 
I don't think the visual of having it look like the twin androids necklace is enough to get the science wrong. I asked Brian if the Romulans would have any advance warning of the supernova. You can actually go through and look at the neutrinos that are created in the nuclear reactions in the center of the star. And they go through a phase where they burn the hydrogen and they burn helium up the chain of the periodic table of elements. So carbon, oxygen, and each of those have a neutrino signal. And if you have the ability to measure neutrinos, and we can already do that on Earth, you will literally be able to watch the evolution of the star. And when they get to the final bit of burning uh, silicon into iron, that only takes about a day or two. And so I reckon you would know literally to a day that it's coming. The group I lead, the Global Supernova Project, has found that most red giants have violent explosions in the months and years right before they die. So even with today's knowledge, I could tell you that a star was gonna blow up a few years from now. The Romulans definitely should have known about it. Of course, the real motivation here is to make the Romulans refugees. That's an idea I can get behind. Be the captain they remember. This has happened before in Star Trek where they take the villain from one series and we get to know them as friends in the next. This happened to the Klingons, the Ferengi, and the Borg. I speak for the Borg. And of course, this is built right into the fabric of Star Trek, who had a Russian on the bridge during the height of the Cold War. This is vodka. Well, this is a drink for a man. Scotch? Aye. It was invented by a little old lady from Leningrad. <laughs> Can I give you a hand here? Oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm just tying up some vines. In the new series, Picard is retired to his family's vineyard just as they suggested at the end of The Next Generation. Would they even be making wine in the future when alcohol seems to be frowned upon in the Star Trek universe? What in blazes is this? Didn't you order scotch? Captain Scott is unaware of the existence of synthahol. Synthahol? It is an alcohol substitute now being served aboard starships. Humans have been making wine for at least 10,000 years, so I'm pretty sure they're not gonna stop in the next 400. But to find out more, I went to the actual Chateau Picard, the Sunstone Winery near Santa Inez. My dad watched about every episode of Star Trek when I was growing up, so I know he was super excited to see that it was actually filmed on his property he created. So in Picard, he's in a chateau in France, but of course we're here in Southern California, so what attracted them to this location? In 1990, my parents planted Sunstone and found out that we were on the same latitude as Provence. Yeah, so my parents handcrafted the villa, and the whole theory was to have people come and stay, but experience it, feeling like they're in France. They started building it in 2004, and really dialed in every aspect of it. So the doors and the shutters all behind us, the windows, the walls and the beams, all this stuff was imported from France. Nobel laureate Brian Schmidt also has a vineyard. When I moved to Australia in 1994, I had already developed an interest in wine during my PhD at Harvard. But here in Canberra, I had the opportunity uh, in 2000 to go out and plant a vineyard on the farm that uh, my wife and I live at. Has winemaking changed much in the last 400 years? It's changed less than you might think, uh, especially at, I would say, the very high end. If you have a few hundred cases, just like my business, Melisme, I would really focus on the old world style. So 400 years ago, they were fermenting fruits on accident in baskets when they're harvesting fruits. They're sitting in the sun, it's going through photosynthesis, and there's natural yeast on the actual fruit. In today's world, we have more control on the characters. So as far as where the grapes are sourced from, using different yeast from different vineyards from around the world, we can control the different flavors or aromas and textures that you're getting from the wine. How do you think winemaking will change in the next 400 years? I hate to say this, but robots and maybe making wine on other planets. <laughs> <laughs> Who yeah. knows? Yeah, I didn't think about that. But yes, that would be amazing. Imagine robots helping humans pluck every leaf perfectly, uh, harvesting the grapes one grape at a time when they're perfectly ripe and of course having all the analytical capability to know uh, exactly how to make these decisions. If these drones can harvest the grapes and water the vineyards but also pull in those grapes and do a fermentation within that unit I think it'll be brilliant but we may not need winemakers after this. <laughs> <laughs> So it seems like Picard has a pretty good vision of what winemaking might be like in the future. 
I also really like how they followed up on the prophecy that they showed in Next Generation. Dude, I'm a fellow in artificial intelligence and quantum consciousness. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. <laughs> what is quantum consciousness? To find out, I went to the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics and talked to my UCSB physics department colleague, Matthew Fisher. So have you published any papers on this? A number of papers. My favorite one is titled, Are We Quantum Computers or Merely Clever Robots? <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> In the show, there's a character that's going to study quantum consciousness. Do you think quantum mechanics has any role in our brain? I do believe that it very well might, and that's what my research is trying to answer. And so I think uh, it's perfectly plausible to imagine that 400 years from now, uh, we will settle that issue, and I'm hoping we'll settle that issue prior to 400 years, <laughs> in fact. So how could quantum mechanics be preserved in the brain? So the nuclear spins inside the phosphorus atoms are very, very isolated from the wet environment. And so quantum information can be held and stored inside phosphorus atoms. Then the challenge is to understand how the quantum program would be implemented uh, by the biological environment you know, surrounding the phosphorus nuclear spins. And we have a, a story about that, where that might occur. It involves calcium phosphate clusters. It involves mitochondria, an organelle inside every cell. Mitochondria have you know, very interesting dynamics. They fission and fuse, and they would be a wonderful uh, mechanism for giving what's called quantum entanglement, where a quantum system if you take it into two pieces, they can be, you know, have what Einstein called a spooky action at a distance and entangle with one another. And so the real idea is can we get different parts of our brain quantum entangled with one another so that when we have a thought, say, quantum to biochemical transduction, it's, oh. it's when the quantum system is collapsed by, the, by us and then we have a thought and an awareness when that collapse takes place. So what are the exact experiments that you're doing and how do they relate to thought in the brain? One experiment that we're doing involves lithium isotopes in rats. And there's a rare type of lithium called lithium-6. And when rats are given the rare isotope of lithium, they behave very differently than when they are given the conventional or more common isotope of lithium. And so that gives indirect evidence that the nuclear spins of lithium are playing some role in cognitive processing. And so here we have many pieces of the puzzle. The organism level where we're looking at rats is one piece of the puzzle. We're also looking for quantum entanglement in mitochondria, in the phosphorus nuclear spins, in calcium phosphate clusters. But do you think we'll be able to make androids in, say, 400 years that are human-like enough that they could pass for human? Probably we will be able to, but I think if we're just using a classical computer, that android won't be fully human and won't have awareness and sentience. But if inside that head of the android is a big quantum computer, God, we need a bigger head. maybe it really can be like a person in every way. To find out more, I talked to another UCSB physics department colleague, John Martinez. He's the chief scientist of the Google Quantum Hardware Group. So what is quantum computing? In a quantum computer, you can store and manipulate states not as a zero or one, which is a bit of classical information, but as a qubit where it can be zero and one at the same time. So if you have two quantum bits, you can have a superposition of zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So now you have a parallel computation of four states. So if I, by the time you get to about 300 qubits, the amount of parallel computation that you would do in a quantum computer is bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So clearly, you could do something there that you could never do with a classical computer. So how many qubits are we up to today? The number of qubits we're at right now is 53. So this was the quantum supremacy experiment. Quantum supremacy. The tech giant says its quantum processor was able to perform a complex mathematical calculation in three minutes and 20 seconds. The same calculation would have taken the current most powerful supercomputer nearly 10,000 years. In the end, our mission is to build a useful quantum computer. And we do that both by trying to build the actual hardware and build that better, as well as people trying to invent algorithms and looking at use cases and really understanding the detailed physics of what we're building in the lab. 
could quantum mechanics be used for artificial intelligence? We definitely uh, think that. In fact, we are the quantum AI lab. It may be possible to use a quantum computer to kind of optimize the selection of data from a big database, for example. Uh, and this kind of optimization problem is kind of foundational idea behind artificial intelligence. Hmm. Commander Data is a great example of artificial intelligence. Call. But since his creator died, nobody's been able to make another stable, intelligent android. That is until this series, when we're introduced to Daj and her sister Soji. I talked to actress Issa Briones about playing a new kind of synthetic life form. Issa, you play a, a synthetic character, but one who seems quite emotional compared to what we've seen in the past for Star Trek characters like this. How do you feel about that? Um, well, I think finding uh, that, that balance was something that was um, a big journey for me, but also for the writers and for uh, the creators of the show. We were all trying to figure out where we wanted to take this character because she is a very new version of what we've seen before. And we've talked a lot about how the show has evolved so much because our world has evolved so much and our technology has evolved. And the empathy that comes out of this character that you wouldn't expect is what drives the story forward so much. If you are who I think you are, you are dear to me in ways that you can't understand. I am detecting a quantum flux in your cellular RNA. It warps quantum signature. Different quantum universe. Quantum state. Quantum fissure. What do you mean, quantum realities? They really like the word quantum in Star Trek. I asked John Martinez to decode it for us. So in Picard, they show a quantum archive. Any ideas what that might be? There is an element of why you would use quantum mechanics for an archive, and they, I don't know if they got it quite right. The difficulty there is these quantum states are kind of fragile, and they're going to change their state and lose their memory. But, it, but they, they were very clever, the writers. They said the quantum archive was in stasis. Everything in the quantum archive is locked in stasis, correct? Correct. Which to me means it was error corrected and whatever. And no one beside myself has access, correct? But the interesting thing about a quantum memory, it's the way that quantum mechanics works. You can only read out the information once, which of course would make it very secure. And no one else has been in here, not even for servicing. Check the records. If someone else read it, then you know that it happened. No one, Admiral. So the quantum archive actually makes sense. Do they ever use the word quantum in a not very sensible way on Star Trek? Well, there was the quantum fingerprinting <laughs> on one of the episodes, which you had to read on the screen. I didn't quite understand what was going on and why that would allow you to find the person. Or people just throwing the word around. Well, you know, obviously it's a high-tech word and people want to use it, but quantum phenomenon is all around us. If we didn't have quantum mechanics, atoms would have no size and we would not be here and the world would be very different. But we're actually trying to store and manipulate information using the laws of quantum mechanics. And that's really a frontier of science and technology and, uh, of course, very interesting to see if we could take advantage of that and help humanity in some way. Romulan methods of forensic molecular reconstruction are illegal in the Federation. Small spoiler for episode two, apparently the Romulans have some technique they can use to reconstruct what happened in a room. Oh, hell no, that's just bull The explosions ignited the flammable vapors in the stratosphere. Mars remains on fire to this day. Something goes wrong and the atmosphere of Mars is ignited. Is that possible? Well, there's methane on Mars today, and methane is flammable. But you can't really ignite an atmosphere. They had to think about this when they were inventing nuclear weapons, because they can reach temperatures of 100 million degrees, which in principle could cause fusion to happen. But the atmosphere expands and cools faster than it can cause runaway burning. That's basically what a mushroom cloud is. It's still exciting, though, that we see methane because it should break down quickly and not stay in the atmosphere. If it's there, maybe it's persistently generated by life. However, there are other geological ways of doing it, so we can't really jump to that conclusion. The Federation builds starships on Mars, so they were looking for a way to sideline all these ships to thwart the Romulan rescue. 
Still, igniting the atmosphere seems lazy and implausible to me. They could have just stuck with your conventional sabotage. Spoiler warning, in the next segment, I'm gonna talk about something that happens in episode eight. So if you haven't seen that, skip ahead to this section. This caught my eye while I was surveilling the cube. Looks like an attempt to depict an octonary. A what now? A planetary system with eight component stars. Is that realistic? Well, we do know about a couple of systems that have seven stars, and they mentioned one in the show. This is New Scorpion, a septenary system which are extremely rare. It's a hierarchical system with pairs of stars orbiting within pairs within pairs. This is really complicated and rare. We don't know about any eight star systems, but that's part of the point. Two, three hundred thousand years ago, somebody drags eight suns together. They hang a planet in the middle. And on this planet, they place a warning. That's Star Trek at its best, taking something from real science and making something really cool that serves the story. The past is written, but the future is left for us to write. And we have powerful tools, Rios. Openness, optimism, and the spirit of curiosity. Star Trek has always been really interesting for having visionary concepts like, you know, communicators that yeah, now have iPhone. cell phones yeah. and things like that. <laughs> Kirk to Spock. As you say, there's this amazing precedent, right? You talk, you look at what Steve Jobs said, and he said so much of Apple was inspired by Star Trek. I don't think Steve's going to announce his transporter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me Star Trek. Many people like Jobs, like Bezos, have looked to Star Trek as the inspiration for the technology that they're bringing to the world. So I think one of the things that often defines the Star Trek technology is that it feels like it's possible. Yeah. They made it in a way that it's kind of believable enough. You can be engrossed in the story and believe that could be a future. When I was a kid, wow, automatically opening doors, how cool is that? We have iPads. We carry it around something right. called a pad, P-A-D-D, -D, on board. Yeah. Beyond inventions, Star Trek has inspired all kinds of people, including me. So I saw The Next Generation in my formative years, and it's one of the things that inspired me to become an astrophysicist. Uh, and so, you know, since then I've helped to discover new types of supernovae and more learn about the origins of the universe. And, you know, you played some role in that. That's amazing. That's so cool. That's amazing to hear. Have you heard from scientists and astronauts that, you know, you've inspired them? And, and what does that mean to you? Oh, yes. Uh, and a number of people I know who work for NASA and even in the case of one astronaut, that the initial impulse to become connected with science and space came from next generation. We talked to people that make movies and TV shows about science and how they approached it, and then we talked to the scientists who are doing the actual science. Which are we? Yeah, well, actually, Star Trek is in a unique place because it both builds so, on things that scientists have learned, but then you also inspire scientists, and so it's like this big mm -hmm, circle. Mm -hmm. And astronauts, too. Dr. Jemison was inspired to become an astronaut after seeing Lieutenant Uhura aboard the original Enterprise when she was a child and asked to be part of the Star Trek universe. I was a huge Star Trek fan from about the age of three onwards. Have you heard any particular stories about fans that were inspired at something in their life they got from Star Trek? Oh. A lot. A lot, yeah. yeah. A lot. I mean, personally for my character, I hear a lot from people on the autism spectrum who mm. related to Seven Struggles, people in the LGBTQ and trans communities that um, have ex experienced that, sim that feeling of being the outsider. I've met probably thousands of people who became psychologists or psychiatrists or counselors or social workers because of Troy. How does it make you feel? Proud. Yeah. Makes me feel really proud that they didn't watch me and go, well, I don't want to do that because she's rubbish. Um, <laughs> you know, I want to do, they say, I want to do that because I like what she's doing and I like her. Has the writing for your character or, or female characters in general gotten better over the years? You really want me to answer? <laughs> uh, it has, actually. Yeah. It has. I mean, I always used to say, look, I know we're doing a show about the 24th century, but it's actually written generally by 20th century men, and you have right. to remember that. Star Trek has always been multicultural, racially diverse, and, while not perfect, ahead of its time in terms of gender equality. The thing that I realized in retrospect, mm -hmm. and what I'm told a lot by women, I make my daughter watch TNG because there are two professional, strong women. Why did you decide to become a commander? I started to feel like I wanted to stretch myself a little. And 
you're an inspiration to younger women that you can do this job. So that's brilliant. You're from South America? Is I am, right? yes. yes. Is your character from South America? Yeah, yes, he is. Although technically there's no nations, but it's federations down this world. But yeah, they were very open to the idea, and I, and I just love to be able to incorporate that and make him Latin. So I speak a bit of Spanish some, at times. Is this the first Star Trek character from South America? That's a good question, actually. Well, uh, Ricardo Montalban was Cap. He wasn't necessarily South American. My name is Khan. So could be. Rios' ship is called La Serena, which means the siren, but it's also similar to the name of a city in Chile, which I go to all the time, because that's where most of the observatories have their headquarters. We go to Chile a lot because the, some yeah, of the best telescopes yeah, of in the world are yeah. there, so I, I like seeing that represented in the Star Trek oh, universe. They also have them drinking a bottle of Pisco, which is a really delicious brandy that they make in Chile. Seems like more of a diversity of voices in every aspect of the show, from the writers to the mm -hmm. producers. And it seems like that's really deepened the characters, and, and I think more people will see themselves you yeah. know, as some future star explorer. Absolutely. I mean, I think especially with Discovery having been what came first, you have Sonequa Martin-Green and Michelle Yeoh as the representatives of what that show is. Necessary, no. But I do like it. All the shows have to be that, because I think that's how Star Trek started. I mean, that's what made that first bridge in the original series so unique and special. I get so excited for a new Star Trek series. And man, is it a dream come true to see Patrick Stewart back at Jean-Luc Picard. Sure, the series can be a little bit talky, but that's all right. It's a nice counterpoint to Star Trek Discovery, which really relied on action a little too much. And the science is pretty good. Yeah, the Martian atmosphere might be a little bit too flammable, but the supernova science is getting better than it was in the 2009 movie, and we get cool new stuff like a future winery and quantum consciousness. The real reason we make this show is to increase scientific literacy. When people ignore science and act out of ignorance, the results can be catastrophic. So I'm glad to see a show based in science and one where decency, compassion, and real leadership are celebrated. Jean-Luc Picard embodies the true spirit of Star Trek. Engage. And in these dark times, that's exactly what we need. Oh, it's a gravitational wave alert. Oh, no, no, don't cut. Let me, like, because it might not be that bad. It's pretty far, so let's press on. Jeez, with the yelling back yeah. there. <laughs> it's a rough room. That He's angry. Yeah. He's I angry. He's so angry. Right. A lot of It's a long story. Yeah. It's, this is the uh, still distant, but potentially scientifically interesting. I have so many questions for you now. Okay, yeah. well, we can turn this interview around. <laughs> <laughs> You're far more interesting than we are. <laughs> no, 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 no. So that looks like a real neutron star merger. Oh, damn. Science doesn't care for filming an episode. <laughs> Jesus, they always have scientific mistakes that could be avoided. And uh, Andy, they need to listen to you a little bit more when they make them. Star Wars is all... <laughs> That's going to the bloopers. There's a reason it takes like eight years to get a doctorate in linguistics. It's actually like really complicated. Okay, I see why that makes sense. Why should anyone give a flying <laughs> I don't think you'll be able to use this. This is too physics geeky. Yeah, that's the thing I've spent zero time in my life as a linguist thinking about. How do you talk to an alien? Uh, I guess the right answer is carefully. 